Prophet Sulaiman had a throne. Sometimes it's described as a carpet, but that's not the description that we get from the Quran nor the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt that have provided commentary on the Quran. The best description that we can derive is that it was made from a celestial substance, something above and beyond the physical world of ours. It resembled a cloud, celestial object upon which he sat. Traditions tell us that the throne of Sulaiman had many thrones, in other words, chairs on which he sat along with his top aides, lieutenants and advisors, that these thrones were studded with the most expensive and luxurious jewelry. And it was from those thrones that he governed his dominion and ruled his kingdom. Traditions also tell us that the size of it, this vessel, the celestial vehicle or whatever you wish to call it, was 6,000 feet by 6,000 feet. So it was akin to an incredible spaceship, not just a carpet. Sulaiman would sit on this and he would travel vast distances. It had incredible speed. The Quran says the speed at which this vessel traveled was the equivalent of a month's worth of travel on traditional means. So he would get from city to city in an instant. He would get from country to country within a day or less. It was this kind of vessel. Now the Quran describes a very interesting encounter. It says that one day as Sulaiman was traveling, he reached an area that again, according to our traditions, has been located around the Levant or the countries now known as Asham. And it was there while he was traveling over a desert that an ant began to address the ant colony. Oh my fellow ants, go back into your homes so as not to be crushed by Sulaiman and his army while they do not perceive you. Because you're too small, you're too insignificant. The army of Sulaiman can easily crush you. So go back and seek shelter in your hive. Now let's pause here a little bit and say something. Sulaiman had such an incredibly powerful, large, fast and beautiful vessel in which he traveled. One of the powers that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given Sulaiman in addition to this, in order to be able to govern and to rule his kingdom, he was awarded mantiq al-tayr, meaning that he was able to speak to birds, but also other creatures. So two points to be made here. Number one, voices of all creatures would be delivered to him. Number two, he was able to process all of these voices, all of the speech by different creatures and animals around the world. And thank God this is in the Quran, by the way. Had this been in a hadith, I'm sure no one would accept it, as is the norm, as is the case in this day and age where the materialistic lifestyles that we lead kind of compartmentalizes all of these stories and fables into the fiction category or the fiction aisle of the library. But it is in the Quran and there's really nothing anyone can do about it unless someone has a disease in their heart, in which case they reinterpret the entire Quran. And they say things like that the Quran was but the Prophet's dreams, people like Abdul Karim Surush and others. So it says that the voices of these creatures would reach Prophet Sulaiman and he would be able to process them and understand their speech. Now this is truly amazing. Just think about it for a moment. If you were sitting somewhere and four people were speaking at the same time, you'd lose the plot. You wouldn't be able to tell what was happening. And yet every single animal, every single species, every single creature would speak and Sulaiman had the capacity to process it all and understand it. Immediately when the ant said the those words, Sulaiman recognized her speech. He ordered the vessel to go down and land. As soon as he landed, Sulaiman said to the ant, why would you say such a thing to the other ants? Why would you instruct the colony to avoid me out of fear that I might crush them and kill them? Do you not know that I'm a prophet of God? Do you not know that I do not oppress? Do you not know that I have knowledge that allows me to avoid even inadvertently killing other creatures? Because she said, 
She said to him, no, O prophet of God, I didn't mean that. I know you're a prophet. I know you're a messenger. I know you don't oppress. The reason I said it to the other ants is you have to appreciate that we live in the dirt. And I didn't want the other ants to look up and see you living this life of luxury, of dominion, having this incredible kingdom, bejeweled thrones on this incredible vessel, and think that what they have is too little and be unappreciative of the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them. I didn't want them to feel that they were deprived because that is one of the byproducts of obsessing over the lives of the rich and famous. After a while, you begin to develop this thought process subconsciously, subliminally, without you realizing, you start to wonder, well, why don't I have what they have? Why am I deprived when they are living in luxury? I didn't want them to feel that way. I didn't want them to obsess over the luxurious lifestyle that you led. Now, let's take a pause here for a moment as well. Brothers and sisters, one of the diseases of this day and age is our obsession with those who are rich, with those who are famous, with those who are labeled as celebrities. And that is a morbid obsession, meaning that it has some very negative side effects in our immediate lives. Traditions actually tell us there's a body of hadith which discourage befriending people who are rich. Avoid those people who are rich. Not because they're inherently evil, not because they're bad, but because of the wealth disparity which is growing day by day, the capitalist system is contributing to this increased global wealth disparity where the poor are getting poorer and the rich are only getting richer and the middle class is being eroded. Because I am not at that level, being in the presence of wealthy individuals will lead to me thinking, why don't I have what they have? And then the next logical conclusion that we draw is either Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God forbid, God forbid, astaghfirullah, He is unable to provide for me as He did for them, or unwilling, and therefore He is a miser. So the hadiths tell us do not befriend people who are rich. Instead, acquaint yourself with people who are poor. That's why the conversation between Prophet Sulaiman and the ant is so critical. Sulaiman landing coming all the way down to the level of the ant and speaking to her, addressing her. Speak to the people who are poor. Befriend people who have less than you. Because when you are acquainted with individuals who are less fortunate than you are, then you begin to appreciate what you have. You become thankful. You become grateful for whatever you have. Because it's a natural human instinct for us to compare ourselves with others. We always keep an eye out and check out the Joneses and what they have and what they don't have, their new car, their new house, their new furniture, their new jewelry, their new clothes. It's a natural human instinct. So if you put yourselves in circles where you don't have much interaction with people who are wealthier and more quote unquote fortunate, which they're not always fortunate because they happen to be richer than you are. Look at what the Quran says. وَلَا تَمُدَّنَّ عَيْنَيْكَ إِلَىٰ مَا مَتَّعْنَا بِهِ أَزْوَاجًا مِّنْهُمْ Stop raising your gaze at those who have been given luxuries and comforts. Why? زَهْرَةَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا Such a beautiful and subtle and nuanced description Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides for the luxuries that people have. He says, this entire world, this dunya, is like a rose. It looks beautiful, it's attractive, it's alluring. And so you pick it. The moment you pick it, the countdown to its death and destruction and decay begins. The moment you take it home, no matter how much you try to nourish it and give it water and sunlight, the countdown has already begun. And within a few days, once you've grabbed it in your hand, it will wither away and die. That is the example of this world. He says, and whatever others seem to have, all these luxuries, all this wealth, all this money that you see them enjoying, they're being tested by all of this. You're tested by having less than they do. They're tested by having more than you do. You're also tested by having more than other people. Everybody's being tested. So if it's a test, then what difference does it make? The Quran tells the Prophet, do not raise your gaze, do not look at them, do not obsess over them. Why? Because when you look at them, you desire to have what they have. When you desire to have what they have, you begin 
to show less appreciation for what you already have. And you get into this vicious cycle where you're never happy. It's never enough. No matter what happens, no matter what you do, it's just not enough. Because there's always people who are richer and wealthier than you are, and you keep comparing yourself to them. Which is why, if you watch these programs that talk about the life of the rich and famous, it's pathetic how they each are trying to compete with the other guy, the one who has a couple more million dollars or a couple more billion dollars, by buying all these toys and by accumulating more possessions, buying more homes, buying more mansions, buying more boats, building a bigger boat, and they keep getting into this crazy rat race where it's about one or two or three additional feet added to their yacht. Now we look at this and we feel this is truly pathetic, but the reality is in our own ways and in our own little worlds, we're exactly like that. Imagine you have last year's flagship smartphone and somebody comes across who has this year's updated flagship smartphone and suddenly you feel like the one you have is garbage and you need to throw it away. You feel like breaking it so you can have an excuse to buy the next one, the next iteration. Only because you happen to see the new one, otherwise the old one is perfectly fine. Working without a glitch, no problems at all. Look at this hadith. A hadith that's narrated from our holy imams, from the tongue of Prophet Isa alayhi salam. He says, لا تنظروا إلى أموال أهل الدنيا Don't look at the wealth of the people of this lowly life. Why? لأن بريق أموالهم Because the glitter and shine of their money and their wealth يذهب بنور إيمانكم Will strip you away of the light of your faith. In other words, you have faith, but that faith is lacking. It's devoid of light. It doesn't give you the inspiration to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as it once did because you keep obsessing about what other people have. Anyway, moving on. The ancestor Prophet Sulaiman alayhi salam, he says to him, I didn't want the other ants to see what you have. I mean, you live in the heavens, we live in the dirt, and then be less appreciative and grateful for what Allah has given them. Another point that I think important to be mentioned here is look at how much this ant cared about its fellow ants, about the colony. It's important to care about the spiritual well-being of your brothers and sisters and family and tribe and clan and city and town and country. It's important to care enough to actually take the initiative. And when you feel like you can step in and do Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahi al Munka to actually do so. Moving on. Then the hadith says, Sulaiman said to her, could you give me words of advice? Imagine God's prophet asking an ant whom he now recognizes as a creature that is wise. He says, give me some words of advice. So the ant says to him, do you know why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you dominion over the wind? Why is it that the wind is the vehicle that carries you around or carries your vessel around? He had full control. By the way, it is incredible if you think about it. Nowadays, a little wind that's a little too fast can cause a tornado and tear down entire states and countries. So the fact that Sulaiman had power over this is in itself incredible. The Quran calls it mulk. This is a kingdom. God calls this a kingdom. By the way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says in the Quran, Am nasa ala ma min Are they envious of what we have given to the people of God's grace? For we have given Ala Ibrahim, the family of Ibrahim, Al Kitab wal Hikmata wa Atainahum Mulkan Adima. We have given the children of Ibrahim the book and wisdom and a great kingdom. Who are the children of Ibrahim? They are Muhammad and Al Muhammad. The kingdom that the Ahlul Bayt had was much, much greater than any prophet has ever seen. So she says to him, Do you know why God gave you dominion and control over the wind? He said, why? He said, because God is trying to tell you that everything that you have is nothing but the wind. It's the wind that carries you around. It's the wind that delivers my voice and sound waves to you. It is the wind that gives you power over other people. At the end of it all, it's just wind. It's just air. And so it's really nothing in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you yourself should never think that you have something when you really don't. The Quran says, فَابْتَسَمَ ضَاحِكًا مِنْ قَوْلِهَا He smiled and he laughed from the words of this ant. 
when he heard this advice and these incredible words of wisdom from her. The point here is this, brothers and sisters, that no one and nothing in this entire universe can take anything from you, nor can they give you anything that you don't have, except by the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's in his hands. No sickness can be cured. No health can deteriorate. No wealth can decrease. No riches can increase except by the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.